We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to this first ever episode of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And in this first episode, amongst other things, we have a plan, but we might veer off it because that's one of the wonderful things about Bob is he's full of words of wisdom and we might go off on a tangent. (laughs) But our plan is to look at what brings people to therapy. Yeah, well, what a wonderful question. So over to you. Have you got some thoughts? I've got many. Perhaps I'll start, actually, Jackie. Go on. I've been a therapist for, well, I've just stopped working clinically. 38 years wow but before that I was in therapy myself so I don't I, know, is uh, that what brought you to being a therapist what brought me to being a therapist was my own traumatic history so um what brought me to therapy is quite quite I, I think it's an actual twist of fate so I'm sure I, that's how I'm going to answer this for you I think people come to therapy usually by twists of fate. Um, uh, I can give you many other reasons, but I think that's one of the reasons that they are come to therapy because the discomfort becomes so high that they need somehow, and the motivation is so high to have a, a less painful life, they come or enter into therapy. Now they might get there by uh lots of different routes in mine i got there because somebody came to up to me and said would you like you know a therapist came up to me and said um something like uh do you want therapy basically it wasn't quite like that um uh, and then i went into therapy to deal with all my own traumas so what brings the therapy i suppose in a nutshell in my case a twist of fate perhaps but basically because I needed or attempted to want to decrease the pain in my life is one of the reasons and perhaps the major reason why people want to come. They may have different motivations in terms they want to resolve things a second time round or getting a different outcome. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense to me. But I think the external reason is they want to take away discomfort of living and get a and have a survive in a different way see i i think i'm going to really enjoy doing these podcasts with you bob because i think i'm going to get to see not just behind the therapy room door but behind the door of bob cook i got into therapy uh, or being a therapist through fostering i was a foster carer and i was seeing second and third generation kids in care and I wanted to do more than just meet their basic needs. That's what got me into it. And, you know, depending on where people are listening to this, I'm not sure whether the UK is one of the only, if not one of a few countries where in order to train as a psychotherapist, you have to have your own personal therapy as part of that training. So I went into therapy thinking there was nothing wrong with me. <laughs> Little did I know when I got into year two and three of my own personal therapy that there was a lot of baggage going on in there. Yeah, I mean, you're correct. The UK, especially the UKCP, the major regulating body for psychotherapists in the United Kingdom, demands that you have your own therapy if you train to be a psychotherapist at least once a week. Yeah. Psychoanalyst three or four times a week. Wow. Psychotherapy is to one hour a week for four years. And many people, I think, do come in from the position you've just said, which was, well, it'd be nice to learn a little bit about myself as part of being uh, on the course. And therefore, let's go ahead. Yes. Why not? Why <laughs> not? <laughs> it's not kind of sure. like addiction, you know, people that, that work with other people with addictions they've usually had an addiction themselves and recovered and then kind of it's paying it forward somehow 
so I think there's a lot of therapists that have had their own personal trauma and gone through the process and then trained to to pass that on to other people I would say I have I I don't know if there's any research done on this. I bet there is somewhere. But I, I know it'd be a high number. I bet it's in this sort of 80%, 75, 80% of people who train to be psychotherapists uh, come to uh, heal their own pain uh, or stroke and help um, cure other people from, yeah. from uh, not having the same journey as themselves. What's your thoughts around the stigma of mental health? If you've been doing this job now for 38 years, have you seen a shift in people's mindset around therapy? Uh, yes, it's become more popularised in the last decade. As when I started, had my own therapy in 84, it was far more hidden. Yeah. In 2021, it's far more uh, accessible, it's more popular. Mental health is talked about uh, in ways that was never talked about 40 years ago. Um, there's a long way to go in many different areas of mental health. Uh, we're in a mental health crisis, I think. Mm. Uh, men still don't come to therapy uh, for many different reasons, but one of them is because they've been programmed not to come to therapy. And I was only reading yesterday, and I was very surprised about it, that the highest uh, rate of suicide in this country is for men under 50. Mm. Extraordinarily high. Uh -huh. So yes, it's talked about more. Uh, it's more acceptable, I think. It's more popularized. Um, conversations on the radio, television, media, uh, many more of them. and. Does that mean that there is services or resources made available to help the stem of the mental health tsunami? I don't think so. No. No. I 100% I agree with you there. You know, the amount of charities that are being set up to try and offer, you know, low cost therapy to people is is phenomenal i i work with um because my son's ex-military i got connected with you know a, a charity that gives as much as they can to you know veterans that are suffering from ptsd and you know that has a knock-on effect for relationships breakdown about all sorts of things you know and and they're one of the few in the northeast i think that can actually offer free therapy to veterans but they fundraise so hard to be able to keep the doors open. Mm, absolutely. And why do people come to therapy? So for people like that, they come to therapy, you know, so people suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, having flashbacks, their lives are, um, uh, how can I explain it, are, really, really challenging because they're replaying and replaying over and over again and acting out the trauma. I think if somebody came to the door um, with that profile, they'd probably say to you something like, I've come to therapy because if I don't come to therapy, my life isn't worth living. Yeah. Now, the step to how they got, have the courage to come to therapy is another story. The reason is to save their life. Yeah, ultimately, yeah. Now, no disrespect to you at all, what I'm gonna say now, but that's a very different motivation to people that have to do as a requirement for psychotherapy training. Oh, 100%, yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean you haven't got your own pain, it's that the motivation, I think, is different. Yeah, and again, you know, looking at what brings people to therapy, for me, I I often talk to, to clients who, you know, they say there's people worse off than me. I haven't been through a massive trauma. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know whether I should be sitting here talking to you. And it's kind of like low level, continuous, systematic 
things happening in our early childhood can be just as detrimental to a big trauma. It's, you know, I don't know whether there's a sliding scale on who should be entitled to therapy and who shouldn't, because we're all unique and what happens in our life impacts us all completely differently. Well, I used to think for many years that one dosage of poison is exactly the same outcome. In other words, in other words, the people's trauma, however deep it is, um, we're all unique. Yeah. However, well, that I still believe, by the way. However, I trained in integrative psychotherapy and I went on long psychotherapy marathons, well, five days, 10 days of psychotherapy where people will bring their uttermost soul, spirit and devastation to. And I remember listening to somebody who was taken off the streets of Lebanon, tortured and uh, discarded for dead. Wow. And I realised that some traumas actually are more devastating than others. Mm. Even though I understand that everybody has their own pain. Yeah. So in some ways, how do I hold those two, two, two contradictions? But I do believe them. Yeah. And I think as therapists, we're all unique as well. We, you know, yes, we, we kind of hold the same basic, you know, thoughts and, and everything around it. Like we were talking about earlier on the DSM-5, you know, that we've got a structure, but I think we all come to it from our own uniqueness as well. We've got our own baggage, our own upbringing, things that we've experienced, you know, and that, that plays a part in the therapy room. Yes, with a without a doubt, people's motivations to come and some motivations to actually, you know, I picked, you know, I got an email from somebody the other day uh, because I do the assessments at the psychotherapy centre, the Manchester Institute Psych Psychotherapy Centre. And she said, it's taken me three months to type this email. Will you help me? So the motivation is the key here and we yeah. are uniquely different yeah and people you know it, how can i say this? it's about co the courage to eventually get to a psychotherapy um from that position is immense yeah and i think for all of us we we have to have courage and to open ourselves up for some people might say, well, it's not courage, it's just simply that I had to because I needed to survive. And if I didn't come to therapy and talk about it, I wouldn't be on this planet. I think that's a minimization of their courage. Yeah, 100 percent. And there's, there's something about courage and vulnerability as well. And you can't have one without the other. I think it was Bene Brown that did a brilliant TED talk around it, that in order to be vulnerable, we have to be courageous and it is you know in a therapy room we're we're sharing deep and dark stuff in there we need to be courageous in order to process that event yeah we have to be certainly extraordinary sense of you know courage and bravery yeah to bear our vulnerabilities and oddly enough the most traumatized people never see it that way in my experience they see it usually uh, as it's the only thing they could do to survive and have a different outcome and they minimize the courageousness of that um, but I'm with you on that one yeah and the other thing, I'm not sure, I, I sometimes the universe throws me clients at the most inopportune moments. I can be going through something in my own personal life and suddenly I seem to get a lot of people through the door that are experiencing similar things to what I am at that time. I don't know whether that's something to do with a bigger force than me or not, but... I think it's true and I also think 
something to do with the filter of the therapist. Yeah. So yes, I think you I get that. Yeah. <laughs> and also how the therapist will filter out at that particular moment in time. I was thinking about as a subject's about what brings the people to therapy. Um, we have a policy to our institute that if somebody phones for someone else, we will say we don't accept third party um, that you put in any words people have to phone themselves to take responsibility uh, and that's an interesting one um, you just read my mind because that was on my list of questions what was, what was in your list just have you ever had you know a, a telephone conversation with somebody saying uh, will you see my wife or will you see my son and the first thing I say is I would love to if you can get them to give me a ring or to text me or message me then I will be happy to talk to them. Yeah, and it's about responsibility and yeah. ownership of that. Because otherwise, how do we know that the other person needs or wants to come to therapy in the first place? Yeah, yeah. And you, you've got to be on board with it. It's like when, you know, and again, you, you touched on, you know, the male of the species. I've had, you know, a gentleman sat in my therapy room that said, well, I'm only here because my wife told me I had to come. Right. There's no motivation, though, if they're coming just because they've been told that they need to do it. No, people have to be motivated to change. Yeah. Otherwise, they are setting themselves up to fail. Yeah. And in fact, I suspect repeat history. I certainly don't want to be part of that process. No. We'll see I, I've also felt at times as well as a therapist that I've kind of been hoodwinked into I don't know being involved in something without my knowing that you know they said that they would stay in a relationship with me if I went to therapy mm. and it's kind of like well that's not gonna help either one of us in that situation mm. you know it, it's it's interesting like you say the paths that people take that bring them in into therapy Mm, that's right and as I said earlier on besides the motivation and there's different forces behind mo motivation Jackie I think but one of them is I think um, is to have a second chance and what I mean by that is the desire unconsciously to get a different outcome yeah Yeah, because I think part of it is that we we replay the same behaviour, expecting a different outcome. You know, if if we've had a bad relationship, we go into another one and it ends up the same. And then we kind of question, why has this happened to me again? You know, that's a lot of the people that I see. I've kind of I've I've. I can't understand why I've had another relationship breakdown, or I can't understand why my boss is treating me the same way that my boss two years ago was treating me mm, absolutely yeah yeah so motivation is key um and i think uniquely key as well yeah what other questions have you got you said you had a list of questions on your well, one of the other things that i think is quite interesting <coughs> in this day and age you know in 2021 <coughs> is i have been criticized in the past in the recent past for charging for my services you've been and, criticized for charging for your services yes and if I was a nice person, I wouldn't be charging people to come, you know, people, maybe NHS workers that have, you know, been through horrendous things. And I should be doing that for free. What are your thoughts around that? <laughs> this is a topic about why people come to therapy. And, and on the back of that, well, you know, besides my, besides we have to make an economic living which is the practical answer to you um the other side is that if it's free if therapy is free then it in a way um how do you have value on that it's like i think that people need to take some responsibility and value of 
putting something back. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we can judge the motivation. Yeah. And the investment in it as well, I think. You you know, there's an awful... I know you at the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy do a low-cost clinic. Yeah, yeah. You know, I myself have low-cost clients, you know, for people that can't afford so it's not that we don't do anything to facilitate it but there has to be an investment and a motivation from the other person yeah otherwise they'll sabotage any chance of success mm. i think you know they will enact history in some way yeah and uh, those are psychological reasons on a practical level purpose have to make a living like anyone else um how, how you know it's like how much we value our you know our time is also a model in terms of self-esteem for the other anyway yeah but uh no every any time i i have done therapy free it actually hasn't worked mm. and what i mean by worked is that the per that the therapist or the sorry the client who comes quite often just drifts away yeah yeah because there's no investment, like you said, there's there's no motivation. It's yeah. Oh. So you know, I definitely needs to be some you know mutual exchange, and I don't mean I'll come and do your garden <laughs> if you you will wash my car. Uh, I think you know there needs to be a proper medium of exchange which represents level of motivation and commitment and investment. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And it's not that we don't want to help everybody, but one, it's an impossibility. And two, like you say, you know, we've got mortgages to pay and children to, to bring up and, and everything else. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting world being a <coughs> psychotherapist. I sometimes refer to it as like the matrix it, when you're in a room with another person, there is so many levels of stuff that's going on you know there's not just me in that room there's not just me here with you there now I've got my different ego states I've got my life scripts I've got all my stuff in this room with us as well and it's you know sometimes people think that therapy is just sitting and talking <laughs> which it is yeah it is and I, I, I was watching Panorama yesterday or the day before and they were talking about is it martin bashir anyway the oh guy, yes the you know, diana interviews martin bashir yeah yeah and that interview i watched myself in 1992 and in it is the famous words by princess diana now when i was looking back at this interview it was on panorama I was remembering myself watching the same uh, real life uh, interview all those years ago when she said those famous phrase, which is those three of us in the relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. so in the therapy client relationship, there's certainly more than two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, we have to commit to the client in that therapy hour of 50 minutes as well that we're not just passing the time of day that you know the the conversations and the interactions and and things that go on in that room are for a reason hopefully we make it look relaxed and comfortable but there's an awful lot of thought processes an awful lot of observations and responses that go on in that 50 minute session yeah it's a human encounter between two people with this huge levels of complexities yeah and uh, this is, it's not an easy relationship to describe to people when somebody says oh what somebody said to me have you enjoyed did you have you enjoyed your career as a therapist bob I've said, yeah, I enjoyed it immensely, and I got a lot of passion, a lot of um, pleasure out of my career. Um, oh, well, what did you do then, Bob? And it's a very thing. It's a very, very hard 
um, process describing the relationship between the therapist and the client and what goes on in it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't put it into a succinct sentence or anything. It's, it, I kind of relate it to driving a car. When you're learning how to drive a car, there's so many things. And I can remember when I was going through my training, one of the things was that why do we never talk about things that have a happy ending? And why, why do, you know, after a weekend of training, I was exhausted. And it was pointed out to me, probably by you or somebody else in the Institute, that people don't come to therapy when everything's going OK. <laughs> so th it's pointless us telling you about the happy endings and all the good stuff that happens in life, because it's not going to be of use to you when you're a practicing psychotherapist. But I can remember thinking, geez, this is this is heavy stuff going on here. Well, that's true. Um, that, that, that bit is true. And I was working with a friend of mine who was a well-known therapist, perhaps not as long as me. Um, but he, he was saying, you know, Bob, are you retiring? Are you retired now? Are you retiring soon? And he was musing about the effects uh, it has on the 70-year-old therapist after a 38-year career uh, in terms of the body and the spirit and the amount of energy that you take on from the other person and the amount of disturbance and the amount of trauma and the amount of anxiety that you actually contain. And he was saying, well, you know, there has to be a cost to that, Bob, for you and for me. And uh, I don't know, but I don't know the public think about that. No. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It's interesting. Yeah. I put a quote up on my social media that was something about that, that, you know, were there to support and to help and, you know, to offer, you know, therapy to people. But we've been through the pandemic too. We felt anxious. We felt overwhelmed. We've been told to stay at home and, and you know, lost family members to it but we're still there doing our job throughout it all. And it, it's, it is difficult sometimes. And sometimes for me, clients really do impact on me. It takes me a while after some sessions to ground myself and to get back into my life after I've had quite a heavy session with somebody. Self-care is really important as a therapist. Well, that's another podcast, but how, we, how do you think we've got on? I think, I think we've got on sort of okay about answering that question about what people's, brings people to psychotherapy. Um, but it's really interesting to muse, muse about, but in the end of the day, thank God they've come. Not 100%. Only, not only because I, I, I would have been out of a job, but also, <laughs> also I hope I've really impacted people's lives. Well, it's a lovely way to end this podcast. And after 38 years of doing it, I am sure you have helped hundreds of thousands of people along the way. Well, well thank you. So we will be back next week for another episode of the therapy show Behind Closed Doors. Yeah, and it's about um, how we choose our therapists. Yes. And the assessment process involved in that, if there is one. If there is one. Very interesting. That's a cliffhanger. Yeah. I shall see you next week. Bye-bye. Take care. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.